Welcome back, Tiger fans. Rockin' Radio's football podcast. I'm Nate Edwards. That's Nathan Hurst. This is Before the Box Score, your fall camp edition. First week of fall camp, a couple days of fall camp. Things are happening. We're not really allowed to see it, but we can promise that the team is practicing because we've seen them talk about it. Uh, both videos and seen the written word, and we know that our beat reporters are there, so it's happening. Um, but it's, it's a long month. It's a long month until we kick off the season, so we're going to pick at every single bit of information that we have. Nathan Hurst. How are you doing, sir? I, football is in the air. It is in the air, which automatically makes my mood ten times better. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know we're, we're we're ever so much closer, 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 closer every day. Uh, yes, uh, July, in my opinion, is always the longest month in yeah. uh, of the year. It, we, as we sit here today, we're recording on July thirty first, so we have passed the the hurdle. We are through with it. We are on the downward downward slide, so all, uh, smooth sailing from here on out. Absolutely, yeah. So we'll do uh, we'll dive into practice stuff, talk about what we've heard coming out of camp, uh, but let's first get into some some business. Uh, we want to talk to you about Rock In Plus. Uh, obviously, if you are watching this live, thank you. You are a subscriber. Uh, we appreciate your subscriptions. Tell your friends. Tell your tell your, tell your mom. Uh, everybody needs to subscribe. Get all sorts of good stuff from Rock In Plus before uh, anyone else hears about it. All the inside information that we are not fit to share on a free site we can put on to Rock In Plus. Obviously, all the good stuff at Rock In Nation that we've always given you is still there. Rock In Plus is just an ex- extra little accentuation to what we can do. Extra, extra stuff for you all to enjoy as far as your Mizzou sports go. Football, basketball, baseball, anything that you could possibly want. Jump on our boards. We'll talk about it there. Now. Along those lines, there's a little special project that a lot of the guys of Rock M have been putting together for, gosh, at least since December uh, when we talked about it. Uh, and, of course, Nathan Hurst was a contributor to this. We're talking about the uh, Missouri Football Preview Magazine. That is coming out soon. I don't know if we have an actual timetable yet, but we know that it's coming out. It is in its final editing processes. Uh, Nathan Hurst, tell us a little bit about what's going on into this magazine. This is, you said a little project, I will uh, beg to differ. It was a very big sure. project uh, sure. that has lots of uh, contributors. It is a lot of a lot of cooks in the kitchen to get this thing uh, pulled across the finish line. We are in the very final, final stages, as you mentioned. Honestly, by the time you listen to this, if you're not listening to it live, there's a great chance it'll be, it'll be available uh, for you to buy um, uh, very, very soon. So, um, Check out, ch- check it out. Check uh, rockm.plus uh, to see if it's available by the time you hear this. If if it's not there yet, um, it will be ready within a day or two. So very soon. Um, you do not have to be a Rockm uh, Plus subscriber to buy the the uh, football preview, um, but it, you do get a few perks um, if you are a Rockm Plus subscri- subscriber. Uh, you you get a discounted discounted version, I believe. Either depending on your subscription, either it's ten dollars. Or five dollars for the full ninety plus page preview. So this is not this is not a small little cutout from the newspaper five five page little little doohickey. No, this is serious in depth stuff. If you're not a Rock M Plus uh, subscriber, you can still buy it. As I said, it's fifteen fifteen dollars for the for the uh, the ninety plus page digital uh, publication. Um, so in the, what what is in this thing? Uh, we've got twelve opponent previews. So we went in depth um on all 12 of our opponents that we know so far um hopefully we'll be playing more than that 12 but of the the 12 we know uh and uh, we're talking not a paragraph we're talking full page multiple page previews in depth for each of these matchups all the way down to murray state so um you know we're 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 less than a month out till we play murray state i know that you want more information about murray state who are the racers why are we playing them uh we're, we we dig into the nitty gritty there, all the way through all all of the uh, um, all the opponents that we play. We got uh, position previews, every position on the field for the Tigers, from interior defensive line to special teams to running backs. If you can think of a position, we've got an in depth pre- uh, preview about the, that position. Who are the expected starters? Who do we think is going to be a backup? Who do we think might be uh, redshirting this year? All that great stuff. We've got. Um, Recruiting and transfer pro, uh, profiles for every single player that is new to the roster. So maybe you maybe you kind of checked out in the offseason. I don't blame you. You didn't necessarily catch all of the recruits that signed on out of high school. You didn't necessarily rec- uh, catch 
all the transfers um, that the Drinkwitz and staff brought in. We uh, outline and uh, and give a preview about every single one of those players. And we're talking, I mean, recruit uh, recruits and transfers, that's more than 30 players that are new to the roster this year. We talk about each one of them, uh, give a little preview about what we think their role on the team this year will be. Uh, we've got uh, columns, multiple features on, um, uh, I, I myself wrote a, a little piece about the, uh, the um, upcoming North End Zone renovations, how that might fit into the uh, overall aesthetic of the stadium. I personally have had uh, season tickets on every single corner of the stadium. Uh, I haven't had them on 50 yard lines yet, you know, uh, one day maybe, but every other corner I've sat in on the stadium. So I feel uniquely qualified to talk about the viewing experiences from various part, parts of the field. Um, so I uh, weigh in there. We have, we have a feature on Luther Burden, uh, Tigers in the draft. Where are they now? What do we, what do we think they're going to do in the NFL? The Tigers that were on the team last year. Um, uh, uh, we sat down with um, the godfather himself, Bill C., uh, and uh, did a, an analytics Q&A with him about what he thinks, what, what the numbers are showing the Tigers will do this year. Um, all sorts of other content regarding college football at large. Pre, you know, we, 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 all of our, the writers voted on who we think um, the uh, all SEC teams will be, who we think the top 25 will be, who's going to make the playoff, who's going to, what the final SEC standings are. This thing is replete with knowledge. Now, you don't hear that word often, replete. It is full of knowledge. Um, and it, I think there was a, at least 10 rock and contributors, if not eight to 10 uh, of us that, that weighed in. Uh, some, some wrote thousands and thousands of words. I wrote a few words, uh, not as many as others, but I had a great, great time doing it. Um, so highly recommend checking it out. It's, it's going to be great. You will, you will enter the season much more prepared uh, having, having done so. Yeah. I, I remember sitting in Dallas with Dan Keegan. And he was like, we got to do a magazine, man. And I was like, <laughs> make it happen, dude. I was all about it. I thought it'd be a great idea. And this is this is his brainchild. He is the one that has pushed, dragged, carried, kicked, whatever whatever verb you want to use. This is his baby, and he and he got it done, uh, obviously, with a lot of help from other Rock M staffers as well. Uh, you all have done a great job. I can't wait to read it myself. Uh, obviously, we've got all the information that you could possibly want. And we are, you know, like, like I said, a month out. From, uh, from kickoff. So why not? Once we get this out, we'll push it out uh, so you can purchase it and consume it to your heart's content. It's all going to be the good stuff that you're used to at Rock M Nation, just on Rock M Plus. Uh, we hope that you like it. And we'll just, it does well, we'll just keep doing it, right? That's that's the goal. So uh, yeah, excellent work, Nathan. Excellent work, Dan and Quentin and everybody else that contributed to the, to the magazine. You all did great work. Okay, let's get into... The actual football stuff, the reason why we are here, podcasting about Missouri football. And we're going to start with the crummy stuff first. Uh, let's talk about uh, breaking the law. And by breaking the law, I mean speeding excessively. Uh, news trickled out yesterday. That was the 30th, July 30th. Uh, Eli Hoff is the one that I saw uh, push it and punch it out, but everyone had kind of a little bit of commentary on it. Uh, but Eli said that the uh, safety Philip Roche was arrested on Monday night after three warrants were issued for failing to appear in court. Uh, Eli goes on to say that since March 30th of this year, Philip has received multiple citations for going 45 miles per hour over the speed limit. Don't know the last time you all drove around Columbia, Missouri, not really a lot of opportunities to drive 45 flat out let alone 45 over. So I got thoughts on this. Uh, Nathan Hurst, your thoughts first. You nailed it in that I live in Columbia. I can't, I think it's been more than a week since I drove more than 45 miles an hour. I mean, I, I, I'd hardly live an exciting life. I drive from home to work to my, you know, child's summer school to back home again. So it's not like I'm tearing, tearing up asphalt in any of those things, but uh, you've got to really try to, to drive that fast. Uh, we, we, we don't need that. We just, we don't need that right now. Um, regardless of who it is, whether it's a backup, whether it's uh, the third string team, you know, team assistant manager that holds the water bottles and sprays them in your, in your helmet. We don't, we don't need that bad, bad vibes on the team at this point in the season. Um, beyond that, just, a, just a pro tip for anyone listening. If you have a warrant out, show up in court. They're not going to forget about it. 
And it's not just going to go away. All right. So then when you have two warrants out to show up in court, they're not going to forget about that or the first one. And then when they issue the third one, they're really not going to, they're really not going to forget about it. And they're going to start getting a little PO. All right. So if you do mess up, if you do decide that you do need to go 45 over and you get, uh, get, uh, uh, get a, a court summons for that uh, unfortunate mistake, show up. All right. Just show up. All right. That, that, because your problems aren't going to go away by not showing up. So just show up, face the music, get a get a lawyer. Don't say anything until you get a lawyer. Show up, go from there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, forty five is egregious, and we've seen we have seen the fallout of what some deem as a racing culture, or others just say a problem at the University of Georgia in Athens of the football team just driving fast the number of arrests tickets deaths in some cases of a player and a staffer for driving recklessly driving fast we've seen it we've seen it it's not great and i don't i don't you know there's a lot of things that you want to emulate georgia for you don't want to emulate this the speeding thing right you don't want to emulate having players die putting other people in danger which is exactly what you're doing when you're going 45 over the speed limit so yeah, um, just as a re- just as a reminder, if you are you know one to five miles over uh, the speed limit, that's a fifty dollar ticket. You know six to ten, I think is like sixty, and then you know once you, if you're going like twenty to twenty five, it's like a two hundred dollar ticket. Twenty five miles over is a mandatory court appearance, and he was going forty five over. So yeah, you know this is even once I'd be like I I'm not a fan of that. You didn't cut that out three times. I don't know, man. That's not that's not worth keeping you around. If that's what you're going to do, uh, we have seen that if you go light on punishment for this sort of thing, then it doesn't really affect certain individuals. Hell, somebody dying doesn't affect some individuals because George is still doing it. Um, so it's it's it was a stupid choice. It was three stupid choices to speed in the first place. Three extra stupid choices uh, to ignore warrants to show up in court. Yeah. It's not not a smart choice, not a safe choice, Philip. I yeah. we don't we don't need that on the team, and I, I don't I don't particularly have any interest in seeing him stick around. Uh, I just checked the the online roster, which <laughs> Ryan Coslin, buddy, you got to help me update this thing. Uh, but I, I he's still listed on there, but uh, from what I hear, he was not at practice today, so I don't know what that means long term. But uh, yeah, not a great start. Uh, you know, day one uh, yesterday. You know, kind of hearing that news, I was disappointing. Uh, and, and, and of course, to the lesser extent, what that does to the safety room in general. But uh, bad vibes, bad vibes all around. Get rid of that stuff. Yeah. 20 year old men don't make, in general, don't make the smartest decisions. Um, I, and I, I think this goes beyond just a, a, a lack of smart decision making. I mean, it reckless is. I mean, I begins to broach on it, but the fact mm-hmm. that there are to do this more than once in an instance where there you, it, it, one slight bump and you are not only endangering your own life, which is incredibly valuable, but endangering anyone else on the road, on the side of the road, in the buildings on the side of the road um, at any point in time. I mean, this is just just as bad, in my opinion, as drunk driving when you get into a car knowingly and willingly inebriated because you are not in full control of your faculties. There is no way that a 20 year old can control a car going 45 over the speed limit to the extent that they need to, um, to the point where uh, they, they, they can control and be safe. It, it, it's the same, it's the exact same in my opinion. Is the penalty for it legally the same? No, uh, and should it be? I don't know, but that's for, but it, it's just as dangerous in, in my yep. opinion. So. Yep. Um, you know, I, am I going to call for him to be kicked off the team? Not necessarily. Uh, I, I mean, I, but does he? Does there need to be some sort of um, line drawn in the sand where mm-hmm. it's shown that this is clearly not an acceptable thing for a member of the uh, Mizzou Tiger football team to partake in? Absolutely. I mean, does that mean he's out for the year? Does that mean he's out for many games? I don't know. Um, but there needs to be something. There needs to be something done because this this can't this can't become a trend. It was obviously a trend for him, a trend for him doing it three different times. So um, he didn't, certainly didn't learn, learn it the first time or the second time. Uh, so someone, someone else has got to step in it. And if not just for him, then to make it clear that 
for the rest of the team that this is not this is not something that's going to be accepted. Yeah, it's for everybody, baby. You're a danger to everybody when you do that. So, set the I will take I I will take blame. Uh, I just wrote an article yesterday on Rock M that uh, uh, talked about how uh, uh, glad I was that I didn't jinx it and that we did have a clean uh, 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 record over the summer. That I actually, to be fair, I wrote that on Monday. It got posted on Tuesday, and then Tuesday afternoon, the bad news comes out. So I will take I will take the blame. I apologize. I you know, if only I had, if only I had kept my mouth shut. <sighs> Tempting fate, unacceptable. Well, moving on. It looks like that the University of Miami in Ohio uh, let the secret out of the bag. They released their football schedule for the next couple of years, and Missouri was not on it. Uh, when previously we were on it, we were scheduled to make a trip to Miami of Ohio. Uh, next year, actually. So it was kind of confusing. Like, okay, well, did they forget? Which, of course, they didn't. they usually pretty good about keeping track of these sorts of things. Turns out Missouri's not going to play Miami anymore. They are not going to make that road trip to uh, to Ohio. And as, you know, as a, as a penalty for backing out of this thing, they are going to give the University of Miami in Ohio $750,000 so they don't have to play this game. Now, I wish they would have done that for UMass, but that, that, that ship has sailed, so we're still going to make that trip. But from a scheduling standpoint, now remember, this is the Jim Sterk era when this stuff was laid out. and He really liked his uh, his home and homes, uh, even, even Stevens with G5 teams, including road trips to aforementioned G5 teams. So I'm not shedding any tears over uh, not having to make that trip. Uh, apologies to any Mizzou fans who live in the central Ohio area. Uh, but Missouri's without a, a dance partner, uh, at least one for next year. So, Hurst, your thoughts on backing out against the Red Hawks, and uh, who are we going to play? I so the first one, I think it's good. Um, that was not looking forward to that trip. I mean, at, at best, it's a it was going to be a you know you win the game that you should have won. And, and not a great fun fashion in a place that you didn't particularly want to go uh, a worst case scenario it you know they get all jacked up for an SEC team coming in and you know something bad could happen so yeah. not uh, not 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 uh, sad about that it was kind of I think hopefully I if I'm correct the last of the string of Jim Sterk trying to save money it was it was clearly a cost saving measure to yeah. do these home and homes with the UMass, with the Miami of Ohio. Actually, I think there still is one on the schedule. We play at uh, home and home with San Diego State, which is a little a little more palatable. But um, I'll go to San Diego, baby. So you don't have right. to convince me. Um, right. But uh, save money because that way, okay, we'll go to you, Miami of Ohio. But when you come to us, we don't have to pay you the whatever $2 million or whatever that it costs to get you to come here for the home game here. Mm -hmm. um, because we, you know, we'll, we'll call it even us going there. Um, that's why I did it. We don't need to save money in that way at, at this point. I, to be to be honest, I don't think we needed to save money in that way seven or eight years ago, whenever this game game was originally scheduled. Uh, but um, I'm glad that they looked around, dug around the couch cushions and found seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. Pay it off. I'm not quite sure why they didn't just say, "Hey, why don't we give you a million dollars and you come here instead two years in a row and we play you home game?" That would have been the easiest thing. Maybe maybe Miami was a little miffed about the fact that we bought out bought the game out and didn't want to play ball that way. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's a, that's their prerogative. Uh, we'll find somebody. Um, do if we have we already have an FCS team lined up for next year on the schedule, don't we? No, we don't. Next year, okay. right now, it's Kansas. Well, Kansas, if you want to count them as FCS, uh, we have the Raging Cajuns of Louisiana, formerly Louisiana Lafayette, and then UMass comes home, comes back to okay. Columbia. So that's all we got so far. In that case, they're, the obvious answer is you find an FCS team that will take your money, um, and there will be many. Uh, I mean, hell, just bring up SEMO. Um, I'd be happy with seeing those guys come up. And, uh, you know, give, play those give guys them, way too much. It, it, you know, uh, th th that's, the, that's the easy way to do it. Yeah. Um, it's a lot harder to find a G5 team that doesn't have – I think there are a few, uh, but they're, you know, few and far between that. 
a has an opening for next year and b is willing you know to come here for whatever we want to pay him so so get it our, out, get it out. yes go for yeah it. our our own quentin corpuel did the lord's work and went through fbs schedules to find g5 teams that don't have enough non-con games scheduled for 2025 because that's what college kids get to do in the summer man they just get to do this sort of thing it's incredible i love them uh so here's the list that he came up with now he he did not include any teams that Mizzou has played recently, so he did not include Middle Tennessee. He did not include Memphis or anything like that. And he didn't include schools that are already scheduled to play Mizzou in the near future, so like you know San Diego State, he did not consider uh, the Troy Trojans. He did not put on here either. So here's a list that he put together, our, 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 our little uh, beat reporter here. We've got Tulsa, Florida International, Jacksonville State. Keep that one in mind. Kennesaw State, Liberty. New Mexico State, who we actually played for two years running to two years ago. Uh, the uh, University of Texas at El Paso, Western Kentucky, UConn, no, blah, uh, Bowling Green, Kent State, Nevada, UNLV, Wyoming, Georgia State, Marshall, Southern Miss, and Louisiana Monroe. Now, if you ask me, what should your non con be? Cake soft. Cake soft. Give me no challenges. Give me no threat of a loss. I understand that if you do lose, it's embarrassing as hell. But don't don't be Arkansas. Don't schedule a home and home with BYU. Don't schedule a home and home with Oklahoma State. No, that's what bowl games are for. That's what the playoff is for. Get yourself four easy wins in the brand new, very tough SEC. So yeah, I'm going G5, and I like to pick some of the most moribund programs on here. I'm talking ULM. One of the poorest, worst teams in the entire college football. Bring them on down. Let's do this stuff. Let's talk Nevada, which is actively disengaged from fielding a football team, but and like still does for whatever reason. Bring them on down. Kent State, when their breakout year is eight wins, yeah, bring them on down. I'll play Kent State any day, all day. Do not like Liberty, just as, as anything that you want to define that. I do not like them. Uh, Jacksonville State is dangerous. I don't know if you know those, but Rich Rod, Rich Rodriguez is their coach down there. Let's not do that. Uh, but Kennesaw State is the brand new FBS team. I'm good with that. Uh, I would be good with Bowling Green. I don't know if uh, you know, Connor Bays like is still going to be around next year, but I'd be good with that. Um, but yeah, Bowling Green, Kent State. I would say UTEP. ULM. UTEP. Give me UTEP. The miners. Yeah, UTEP's putting stuff together, no. man. No. no. And no Western Kentucky. I definitely don't definitely don't want no, the top up here. No, I don't like that. That that's a that's an annoyance. Uh they are they are annoyingly good on one side of the ball, and that'd be no fun. Um, I know we already play Illinois starting in 2026. I don't think they'd be open to kick starting that early, but hey, if you like getting your butt kicked in St. Louis, you know, we'll do it. Um, but I would I would go G five um and and or FCS and just get the win. That's all I'm looking for. Absolutely. Uh FCS, one of the G5s. Bowling Green gives me gives me uh, some some bad bad memories. Uh, oh, uh, Urban Meyer, O2, yeah. Uh, early in the Pinkle days, but also uh, 2009. Nine, we had a very scary game with Bowling Green. Freddie Barnes, yeah. Came down to the last drive of the game. If I have to, if I'm remembering correctly, get Blaine, Blaine Gabbert finally put together a couple drives. We were losing the vast majority mm-hmm. of that game yep. in some nasty, like 19 to 13 kind of score until we finally score a touchdown towards the end. So I, I I'm good on passing on Bowling Green, even if they have been pretty horrible in recent That's years. Fair. That's fair. Well, I have no doubt that, uh, uh, Oh gosh, Laird Veach. Wow. I almost, I have not said that name out loud uh, yet. So yeah, Laird Veach, there we go. Well, he's going to find somebody. Um, you know, we've got money to throw around. Uh, there are plenty of programs who would be happy to take the check, take the loss. Uh, so we will fill it. But thankfully, we are not making that road trip to the Eastern time zone. Once again, Jim, I don't know what you're thinking, man, but uh, glad we're not doing that. Very excited about that. Okay, so now we're getting into the good stuff. Because, like, you know, at the same time, we love – college football is being back camps are starting but you don't learn anything you know you don't really figure out much of anything because it's you know 40 minutes of open practice and they're really not even showing you anything at that point anyway but you know what doesn't matter it doesn't matter because football's back and you can just 
mm, eat all those morsels, all those little crumbs. So from the crumb department, let's talk about new numbers, baby, because we got them. We got them. Uh, running down the list here. Uh, now, not everybody has earned it, but from our intrepid reporters who are out there, this is what it's looking like. In numerical order, let's go through here. Drew Pine, number six. That's our transfer quarterback from Arizona State, late of Notre Dame. Williams Winery, we all know that guy. Number six, Darius Robinson is now Williams Winery. Yeah. Oh, the vibes are strong with that one. Uh, Courtney Crushfield, number seven. The old Chris Abrams drain Cody Schrader number. Uh, Kwan Lacey, the blue chipper out of Texas, running back, number 11. Uh, Austin Dindy, our safety athlete, tight end safety. He is going with number 18, which is a very versatile number, and I love the potential of what he can do with that. Uh, Nick Rodriguez, blue chipper linebacker, number 20. That's yeah. fun. Uh, walk on Adam Molitor, the tight end, number 28. The uh, Khalil, tra- uh, Khalil Dr- Jacobs, the transfer, there we go, South Alabama. He is going to be wearing number 29. Uh, Jaron Sensabaugh, the corner, 32. Uh, Jackson Hancock, who did earn his number, by the way, number 34, Jeremiah Beasley, the late flip uh, away from Michigan after he hated it in spring camp, apparently. Uh, He will be number 38. That is a clunky number for such a good player. That's going to change. Marcus Bryant, our transfer from SMU, offensive line, number 52. Justin Bodford, uh, defensive tackle from Florida. He is number 55. Love that. Uh, (laughs) Jackson Daly. You've got to have a a real – the body for a 55 you do you have to have the body for a 55 just yeah. not any joe can can sport 55 no and, and not a lot of mizzou players rock the 55 i think jordan harold was the last one who did he was a walk on defensive end 55 is not a number that most dudes wear i love that for him uh we get into kind of the walk-on territory jackson daly linebacker 58 graham gilmer offensive line number 61 Whit Hayford, that probably should be an offensive lineman, but now he's a tight end. He is 85. Uh, Elias Williams, the breakout blue chip defensive end, uh, number 91. Brady Bain, the kicker, 92. Jalen Brown, defensive end, 93. Eddie Kelly, the late transfer in. He is going to be number 97. And then a walk-on defensive tackle, Jadon Frick, number 99. So that's that. I, I love seeing how numbers – mutate and transform it over time like who wears what uh like i said 55 is not a number that gets a lot of love uh mostly because guys switch out of that as soon as possible but um yeah you want the single numbers right that's what the guys are always shooting for and it seems our blue chippers got it um and jackson hancock you know he's the first one to earn his number which is pretty great uh hurst what are your get if you had a, if you had to put money on it next guy to get a number officially get a number who are you gonna who are you gonna put money on I that list was so long. I'm having a hard time thinking of who yeah. hasn't who hasn't got one yet. The one thing that stuck out to me was how many how many players have earned their numbers already. It, it seems very early on in fall practice for the number of especially high school uh, incoming high school uh, players earning their numbers already. And I, I don't know if that means they're just kind of a little more lenient with what it takes to earn the number. Or if these guys are just playing great and then they've legitimately earned it in the same uh, same way that others have, I'm not sure. It just seems like a, the list is longer than it has been in the past. Um, yeah, I can't remember which of the high school. I guess all all the players from who played in spring practice had already earned. They all got them. Yeah, all their numbers. Yeah. So yeah. off the top of my head, I'm I'm having just, uh, trouble even thinking of anybody that hasn't who, who, what is the list of those who haven't yet you i mean that? aiden glover doesn't have his glover. number yet okay. but like i don't think he's gonna have a lot of opportunities to get it um jude james uh he does not have his number yet or at least isn't wearing it uh but that's that's kind of another tight end kind of situation like how how many opportunities are you actually getting i, I don't know how they grade right this is all motivational mumbo jumbo so i don't know how they're gonna do it but you know i'd like to think that the quarterback could probably get it you know uh, not that there's much being asked of him this year, but um, yeah, I don't know. I do like. Are you a, are you a number purist? I know you're an NFL guy, so you kind of grew up with like these positions have these numbers. But me growing up in Mizzou, and especially at Gary Pinkle Mizzou, it was like, hey, give a defensive end eighty five. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I like that sort of thing. Where do you stand on on number chicanery? I don't. I don't have a strong opinion on it. To be honest, it is. It does kind of make me double take 
seeing Sam Horn with number 21. I mean, that that's just kind of weird. Do I have I love that. Am, am I offended by it? By no means. Uh, just kind of weird. Um, I, I do like I say that I say I was about to say that I, I like the idea of offensive linemen having, you know, the 60s and the 50s and the 70s. But if you if you gave me an offensive lineman with the number in the 30s, I think that would be kind of awesome, too. Now, I know that causes some procedural issues with yeah. el- eligible receivers and all of that stuff. But if I was if I was going to go out outside the box a little bit, it'd be kind of cool, cool to give uh, give the big hog mollies single digits. So that would be fun. Give me is- give me Caden Green with the number one. Oh man, it is a shame that they don't get to play around with it like everybody else. Um, really big missed opportunity. Really, you know, the only thing you can do like fun is like you know neck rolls or roll your jersey up so you show your show your big boy belly. You know, you're coming after this man. I'm going to eat you up. Um, you you don't you know you don't get the number fun. I do love what was that? It was the 2013 season when Michigan's quarterback wore number 98 in honor of their Heisman Trophy winner. And they went up against Notre Dame, who had big, sexy defensive tackle wearing number one. And there's this picture of the D tackle, like trying to swat the ball away with the number one prominently displayed and the number 98 on the guy throwing the ball. And it was a whiplash weirdo kind of thing. It's like, what planet am I on right now? It felt like, you know, at the time, bad AI before we even had uh, bad AI doing that sort of thing. A weird um, body body swap in motion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I I love funky numbers, man. I love it. I love that you know we had Marcus Golden wearing thirty three as a defensive end. I love that Allen Smith was eighty five. You know, you talk about like Tommy Chavis and Striker Sulak not wearing numbers in the nineties. They're defensive ends back in 07, 08. I love that. You know. Um, if you have, you know, a running back wearing 11 seems odd to me. 11 seems more like a, like a quarterback or a receiver number. So you got, you know, quick little small guy. I like that. Um, yeah, get funky. You know, with college, you got 125 dudes. There's going to be overlap. There's going to be doubling up. That's why it's a little bit more lax at the college level. So get creative. I think the most creative you could do, I mean, do you remember Bud Sasser, 21, wide receiver? Yeah, yeah, that, was, that kind of always felt weird. I expected him to line up in the backfield and yeah i mean i get like the slenderness of a one that makes sense what never made sense to me was gerald jackson number 29 yeah that was <laughs> that was it was so weird that it was cool like i kind yeah. of like because the number was so awkward looking because you yeah. don't see a lot of 29s in general if you do it's on a defensive back usually but yeah um uh, yeah it just kind of felt like oh this is good good dissonant jazz music right here <laughs> Yeah. that same that same feeling it's like this isn't this is cool it's weird yeah <laughs> i just yeah and then so often now you know you get a player if they have a breakout you know like alden smith in 2020 20 you know 21 22 23 he wouldn't have been 85 anymore he would have been like five right because like terry uh, terry beckner was number 79 as a defensive tackle. I love that. Just a big, ugly number on a big, ugly dude that destroyed stuff. And then he went to five. It's like, oh, yes, it's sleek. Yes, it's cool. But, oh, you could have been so hipster and fun with 79. So, yeah, I mean, Cody Schrader was 20. He switched to seven. You know, Chris Abrams' dream was 14. He switched to seven. You know, you just, if you're good, then all of a sudden you have pull on the number that you want until you get it. So, if you are 55, you know, if he's going to ball out, he's probably going to switch to like four, you know, just to be cool. That makes me sad, but so lame. super lame. I, I know that there are players who are very superstitious about their numbers, like, you know, especially receivers who feel like 89 makes them feel fat. And so they don't run well. I'm like, OK, I mean, whatever you need, man, <laughs> you tell yeah. me. To be fair, 89 is not a fast number. 80, weirdly, 88 is, but 89, not. not yeah. Fast. 87 should always be a tight end. Yeah, 89 is a just possession receiver, just someone that sits in the yeah. middle of the field, catches it, and just gets their head taken off every time over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Chase Coffin was 45. That still is a very weird one, you know, yeah. as far as a tight end goes. But anyway, so we got numbers. That's pretty cool. Uh, not, I don't know how many are earned or whatever, but you know, they they they've got them assigned, so that's good. Uh, again, please update the the online website, Ryan. Cause, please, I'd love to know what the updated weights are and uh, all the numbers assigned. That'd be really great. That help me out 
Um, so anyway, there you go. Uh, as far as just kind of report stuff goes, you know, again, there's not a lot happening. You get about 40 minutes of open time and most of that they're stretching, maybe doing a drill here or there. Uh, but we're sending people to the practice. So we'll, you know, we'll get back to you on what's happening here. Uh, to no surprise, Brady Cook is QB1. An additional no surprise, it seems like Drew Pine's going to be QB2. That's why you brought him in. Here's the question that I had going in, and I still don't know if we're going to have an answer, Nathan Hurst, but it seems like for all the years that Eli Drinkwitz and Curtis Looper have talked about running back by committee, we're going to have a committee approach to this sort of thing, not just one guy. <laughs> we might actually have it because Nate Noel – and then Marcus Carroll have been alternating on their snaps and all their practices and stuff like that. And it seems like their drills are showing that maybe it's a little bit one, a little bit the other. You know, the only real time we saw this was 2022 when we had Nathaniel Pete and Cody Schrader come in and Pete started as a starter, but they kept swapping him out. And finally Schrader took it over towards the end of the year. You have two seniors, both of whom have gone over a thousand yards in their individual seasons. Is this the year that we get a committee approach, Nathan Hurst? I, I certainly think it will start that way. Yeah. Now, does it finish that way? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I I believe the coaches, when they say they want to have a committee approach, um, and that just be the logical way to do it. You, you don't want to have one guy get the crap beaten out of him for 12 straight weeks when you have another guy who's just as good You know that could be taking taking some of that on. That said... You know, I, all it could take is one or two fumbles by one of the guys or a missed block, missed pass pick, you know, pass pro pick up and, and lead into a sack. And that gets one of the guys on a little bit of a, on a you know, doghouse. And before you know it, the next guy, the other guy has a couple of nice runs. And then, you know, before you know it, it's 80, 20 or 90, 10. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, so I, I think it'll start that way. Ideally, I think, Mizzou will be the most successful if it stays that way and they both are contributing, meaning they're both playing and they're both playing well. Um, but however, on the flip side, Mizzou would be the least successful if they were both playing and neither of them really play, playing super great. I mean, that that was one of the big reasons why the offense in 2022 wasn't great is neither Schrader nor Pete were really very good, to be honest. I mean, the offensive yeah. line wasn't great either. Um, but Schrader really hadn't figured out the SEC level yet. And Pete just never really got there. Um, and that, you know, that kind of just led to a very limp running game. Um, so I hope so. I hope it works out. I hope they're both awesome. I hope they both run for a thousand yards this year. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, I don't know if that'll happen, but there certainly are enough yards out there. If just from what Schrader got last year, if we cut those in half or <laughs> damn well close to a thousand yards a piece for the, for, for both of the, both of the guys. So we'll, yep. we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I'm yeah. However they want to do it, I'm fine. You know, if you want to put put both guys back there, you know, kind of run a veer triple, knock yourself out. I'm all about that. Um, yeah, put Luther Burden as a slot back. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. Marcus Carroll is your fullback. Noel is kind of yeah, your B back. I, I don't. I can see it. Um, so I mean, you know, that's that's we'll see how that shakes out. I think I'm with you. I think all the intentions are we want to do this. I think their hands have been forced past couple of years just from a trust issue but you got not only do you have noel and carol you have you know jamal roberts for all intents and purposes had you know really impressed in practice really impressed on special teams which just could not was not better than cody schrader you'd like to see him kind of break in as a third guy you know or tavoris jones right he's been here for a couple of years now a little on the smaller side but like he's he's been in college you know kawan lacy Bro, if you want to take over and just go with it, that's fine. But also, you know, they're kind of light, 190 pounds, I think it was, is what that is. So, like, that's considered light for college nowadays. Um, and does he, you know, is he up to speed? We don't know. Can he can he blast block? We don't know. Uh, so we'll we'll figure that out. But I'd like to start seeing some carries broken up so it's not 90-10, you know, where you have 80 carries spread out for all the other running backs for the rest of the year. Uh, but along the pass block standpoint, as far as practice goes, I mean, again, this is these are drills, these are warm ups, these are not anything that you can take, you know, right home, but we're going to analyze the crap out of it. So far, it looks like Marcus Bryant, uh, the transfer from SMU, and Javen Richardson, the Juco acquisition, are at left tackle, splitting reps there. Then you have Armand Mimbu at right tackle. So he has not moved. Cameron Johnson at right guard. 
So he has not moved. Despite potentially moving him to left guard, like they talked about in the spring, he is currently slotted at right. Connor Tolleson at center. We all knew that. Caden Green, the I'm not playing in Oklahoma because I like to be a tackle. Caden Green, left guard. So if you go Bryant, Green, Tolleson, Johnson, Mimbu, that makes sense. We're good with it, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think that is the best, or at least getting the most talent on the field in the positions where they're all the most comfortable in. If I had to draw it up as the ideal way, uh, that, that's how I would have drawn it up from the beginning, um, assuming that everyone's happy in their roles and can, and willing to you know pull them all, all in the same direction, which by all accounts, it seems like that's that's the case this year. Mm-hmm. Um, I like hearing that David Richardson is you know in that probably will end up being the second string left tackle because I really see him as a valuable swing guy where he could play either side if there happened to be an injury or you needed to go for go uh, run a formation with six offensive linemen throw him uh, as an additional tackle way out on the end i'm glad that he's playing well enough to do that i think he was kind of a real under the radar i guess you could call him a transfer he's a juco guy so he's, he's not a, really a high school recruit coming on but no he was very un under ballyhooed uh, mm-hmm. Coming in, but I think he could bring a lot of uh, a lot of stability and, and depth to the line. So I'm glad to hear his name um, getting thrown out there. Yeah, this is the way, this is the way that it 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 will be best. Um, it makes sense to keep Johnson in the right because on the right side, even though they had talked about moving him to the left, I think that would have only happened if we hadn't gotten Bryant and Green ended up playing left tackle. Mm-hmm. But um, this way. Johnson, who's comfortable playing next to Mimbu, they've got a nice thing going on the right side. They can stay solidified there. Keep Green on the left side so that next year, when Bryant graduates and moves on, then I think it'll be a lot easier for Green to move into the left tackle position from the left guard as opposed to move from the left tackle position from right guard. He'll already have you know been taking reps on the left side, mm-hmm. um, and I think that'll be a little bit of an easier transition for him that way. So it's kind of thinking down the road a little bit. Uh, by the coaching staff, which makes a lot of sense to me. Sure. And then the backups, the second team, if you go right to left, Mitchell Walters is at right tackle. Curtis Peewer is at right guard. Tristan Wilson is center, uh, who has been a guard the past couple of years, but he is now apparently going to be your backup center, or at least taking backup center snaps. And then uh, Logan Reichert, the blue chipper uh, out of Kansas City, Raytown. He is your current second string left guard. So, and then, of course, Brian and Richardson are, are switching off on uh, left tackle. So I don't know how many of those guys we're going to see. You know, just because your second team doesn't mean you see rotation uh, in any of the games or anything like that. It just, like you said, it comes down to injury. It comes down to spelling somebody who you got rolled up on or is out of breath. And you need to have at least one, probably two to three guys that can come in and just do it for a little bit. Um, and I, you know, past couple of years, we haven't had that 2022, we didn't have it. And the offensive line sucked in 2023. We didn't really have it except for one guy and it didn't matter because everyone was fine. So that luck is not going to last. Uh, it'd be nice to have some depth. So that's kind of what we're looking at right now. The other big takeaway, at least from, uh, from our beat reporters who were there is, uh, Jamarian Wayne, who has had an odyssey since he has stepped on campus here, started off as a wide receiver. Then last year he was switched to safety. And then in the spring, he was getting snaps at corner. I don't know if you watched Jamarian's high school tape. I did. I was like, wow, just an athletic dude. Not sure if he knows what he wants to do, but a lot of potential there. And, you know, I, I love to get him on the field and just there never seemed to be a way to do that effectively. You walked into a crowded receiver room, walked into a crowded safety room. Corner is a little, a little thin this year, and he's getting snaps, and I guess he's getting enough, at least as far as his drills go, um, which really, you know, the concern for the, for me this year is the secondary, specifically corner. You lose two to the NFL. How do you replace that? I don't, I'm don't. i not saying Jamarian Wayne is going to be the next, second coming of, you know, Chris Abrams, Drain, or Ennis Rakestraw, but it makes my heart happy for his story to be effectively seen in the field. And Hurst, for me, I mean, it's just, hey, we got another option at corner if the first two don't, don't, don't watch out. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a guy with the obvious athletic ability of Wayne, you, it's important to find a way to use him one way or another. I mean, if he's a top-level athlete, get him on the field, whether that's as a cornerback, whether it's as a safety, whether it's just blocking on the punt block team or the um, the kickoff, the kick, kicking field goal block team. 
the kickoff return team, whatever, however you can get the, get this guy on the field. And that's kind of the coach's job to figure out where, where he fits best. Um, I think cornerback would be great, especially if he can work in as early on in the year. If, you know, hopefully if we were to ever blow out anybody early in the year, get, get him some good reps um, and just, you know, see what he's got, see if this is something that we can grow with. And is he going to be a major contributor this year? Probably not, but he's got three more years after this year, I believe. So, um, you know, he could build into that because we're going to need to replace at least one, if not both cornerbacks after this year again. Be nice to have somebody that you could already have on on the team that could do that. Yep. So Wayne has got this year twenty five and twenty six because he redshirted. So yeah, it's it's possible. You know, or also you know Shamar McNeil, he's in his uh, second year after redshirting last year. He I know he's super light. He's not even one hundred and seventy pounds. He's six three. That's the old Nate Edwards in college approach to weight and height. Um, or you know Nick Deloach out of Cahokia. Uh, six foot 175 also redshirted last year i mean we we just don't know what those guys are and they're super young so it'd be nice to have somebody step up there and, and make an impact uh but yeah i mean again it's fall camp guys there's not a whole lot of news out there but we'll take every morsel that we can and break it down as we hear it and obviously we're not going to stop we got a whole month of this before games start so uh, we're going to take all the news that we possibly can and hopefully no more breaking the law um we're going to shut this down. I have an interview with SEC Mike, Mike, uh, Mike Bratton, and it's coming up after this. Uh, so our live portion is going to wrap up, and then you can stick around and you can listen to that. So Hurst, before we leave, words of wisdom from you other than don't go 45 miles per hour over the speed limit. And show up to court if you do. Just show up. Just show up. Show up. It's not going to go away. Just show up. <laughs> in, in every part of your life. That, that's yeah. the words of wisdom today. Just show up. show up. Show up and good things will happen. Or at least not, not bad things. Hopefully. Not bad things, yeah. yeah. So, uh, anyway, yeah, th- like I said, that's going to be the end portion of us. Like I said, there's going to be an interview after this that you can listen to, which is highly encouraged. Uh, it's a it's a SEC guy who has nice things to say about Mizzou, so stick around. But that's the live show for today. As always, we appreciate the downloads and the subscriptions. Leave a comment or rate us. We love all types of feedback from you all. You can follow us at Twitter. I'm at Nate G. Edwards. He's at Burst Hurst. Follow Rock and Flagship at Rock and Nation Podcasting Outlet at Rock and Radio. We appreciate you tuning in this time. Stick around. SEC Mike is coming up. M-I-Z. Z-O-U. It's a Rock M annual tradition. We bring in SEC Mike from that SEC podcast. We talk Missouri football the week after SEC Media Days. The guy who was there, the guy who's talking to the people who are there, who was connected with SEC football, to have him lend some insight on what he learned in the past week, what he thinks is going to happen next year. We'll talk a little bit about the good guy, Tiger. So, SEC Mike, welcome back, sir. Hey, Nate. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always. And just want to say, big fan of you and your show. And you've been coming on my show, that SEC podcast, for a long time. So, I, I really appreciate any time I can return the favor. Absolutely. It's always great to talk to you. you got, like I said, you know the SEC in and out. You've been speaking to the people for the past week, so you got a pretty good pulse on what's going on. And I think, you know, when you go back in time to when we first started doing this, I think 20, 2020 was when we first started chatting about football. We were talking about how Connor Bazelak might not be the guy and Missouri's looking for a couple of impact transfers. And then the year after that, it was, well, what's Eli Drinkwitz going to do now? And then the year after that, it was Cousin Shane saying, oh, 10 wins. And everyone's like, what? And now we've got SCC Mike on the Mizzou bandwagon, at least for this year. <laughs> uh, not only do you feel good about the team, but you're feeling good about our quarterback. I saw that you released your, your quarterback rankings. And, sir, you put our own Brady Cook uh, as the number one quarterback in the SEC, I, 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 I'm not saying you're wrong. I just, my first question is what factors go into your rankings of quarterbacks and how does Brady cook of all the SEC quarterbacks rank him on those factors so that you placed him number one overall. Yeah. And this always uh, causes some slight confusion. I used to even put it on the graphic, but nobody reads the graphic. They just look at the names, look at the number and then the outrage ensues. But Uh, I think any idiot, and believe me, I'm an idiot, so I would know, Uh, but anybody could just come up with, uh, you know, their rankings and and where they are today. I don't take much pleasure in that, Nate. What I'm trying to do and what I do every, we put this out in July, right? We timed it pretty well, right, right before media days. But this is a projection, not today, 
of how how you would essentially draft the quarterbacks or rank the SEC quarterbacks. I'm trying to look ahead to the end of the season when all the games are played. How are we going to rate these guys based on the season they had? Not not trying to say NFL potential draft. I don't I don't give a damn about the draft. I'll be quite honest with you. I mean that, that's great. I want everybody to get drafted, but that's not what this is. This is at the end of the year who will have the best season among all SEC quarterbacks. And I th- I put Brady Cook number one on that list for a lot of reasons, but one of them is Luther Burden, who I th- I think Luther Burden's the best player in all the college football coming into this season. That's that's huge for Brady. Year two, Kirby Moore's offensive system. I think Missouri, uh, and it's not just Luther, but it's guys like Theo Weiss and, and Mookie Cooper and their emerging tight end and, and their solid offensive line. I just think Missouri's offense is going to be dang near unstoppable next year. Would It wouldn't surprise me to see him average about 40, 45 points per game. Now, I, I think there's going to be a, a slight drop off on the defensive side of the football but again, that's just going to lead to uh, a more explosive offense. And who knows, we may be getting into some shootouts. May need Brady to score yeah. a ton of touchdowns. And and heck, I, th- I thought by the end of last season, he was really clicking. It was, If I recall, I mean, this is the first time we've seen him healthy was mm-hmm. last season. And we, and we saw the potential there. So uh, I, I just think year two, that offensive system, all the pieces. And in, in little, I, I know Missouri fans are probably – tired of hearing about the schedule but schedule I think factors into it a little bit as well because realistically I think there's only three games where Missouri is going to be I don't I wouldn't even say an underdog but you know in a toss-up situation and maybe one one or two underdog situations so putting that all together I think Brady Cook's going to have one heck of a year well we think so too and I, we're glad that you agree with that. Um, you know, so thinking about your team rankings, because you you released those, you got Georgia number one, you got Ole Miss number two, uh, which I think some people might be surprised of. Um, and then, you know, of course, newcomer Texas is four. You got Missouri at three. And again, you know, obviously everyone's got their way of doing things, but, you know, Missouri is the third best team in the country. I know everybody at SEC Media Day seems to think that they're sixth. You know, it's like still good, but – kind of in an interchangeable place maybe uh, with your, t- you know, Ole Miss and, 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 you know, LSUs and stuff like that. So you got them, you know, slotted at three. Obviously, you know, Brady Cook's going to play a big part of that and Luther Burden as well. But I guess when you look at Missouri, which individual unit other than quarterback, uh, which individual unit of the offense or defense do you think is the best on this Missouri team? Um, I, outside of quarterback, pr- probably receiver. Um I believe I'm I'm trying to think of the numbers in my head here. I think Missouri is second in the SEC in returning receiving production, second only to Arkansas. Uh, but when you talk about receiving units, Nate, I, I think there's three teams that come to mind, Missouri, Ole Miss, and believe it or not, Oklahoma. I think those three are going to be battling it out for the best receiving core in the entire SEC. And, and heck, if you have the best receiving core in the SEC, you, you make a, a really good case to be the best receiving core in the country. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people got Georgia in there, but <laughs> I, my goodness, I, I don't know when this is airing, but they've had another arrest just, just today. So, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I get it. We probably shouldn't joke about that, but again, it's, it is what it is. I, I, I think Missouri's receiving core is, is vastly underrated with, uh, you know, Johnson coming in a second year, Mookie Cooper, I think would start for a lot of teams. I don't, I, I guess if you go three receivers, he'd start, but again, I, I don't even know if he starts for Missouri just cause they're so loaded at the position. Yeah. I mean, he couldn't cut it at Ohio State, which a lot of guys can't, but he can cut it at Missouri and probably a lot of other places too. Um, the Mookie Renaissance is something that we're looking forward to. He, he finally had a good year last year, and hopefully he can build off of that, even with all the potential guys that they can throw targets to. You know, it's going to be tough to find uh, find a few to succeed. But yeah, I, I would agree. Receiver's definitely up there. So, I mean, obviously, you can't have a college football team without some kind of weakness. So on the flip side, if you think the receivers are the best, uh, that Missouri has to offer outside of quarterback. Which individual unit on offense or defense do you think is the worst on our team? Yeah, probably. Uh, 
well, worse may may be a stretch, but uh, again, I don't even think you're you're looking at it this way because you you did say offense defense, but uh, an unknown certainly would be kicker. I would throw that out there just because I was I was such of a big fan of the thicker kicker as we all were. But if you just want to limit it to to offense or defense, it's probably the secondary. And again, I I know they've added some pieces there, particularly at corner. Um, you know, you send a couple guys to the NFL, a lot of teams can reload at that position. Can Missouri do it? It remains to be seen. And, and I know they they were active in the transfer portal, added some pieces like Toriano Pride. I'm, I'm not saying he's a bad player, but I also think that fans, and it's it's not Missouri fans I'm calling out here, it's, it's all of us, that essentially you add a transfer and you say, okay, we're good. I mean, it's not a video game. You know, they have to learn the new system. They have to learn their teammates. They have to Heck, they have to, to learn what it's like going up in the SEC week in and week out. So I, it generally, in my experience, transfers make a, a significantly bigger impact year two than they do, they do year one, even if they're starters from day one. So I would say, even though you got some nice pieces in the secondary, I, I think secondary is, is probably, a like I said, a concern for me because Missouri may have had one of the best Probably not the best. I'd say Alabama certainly had had some outstanding corners last year, but you know, one of the best duos in the SEC, and you're and you're having to replace both those guys. Yeah, not easy to replace NFL caliber corners, let alone two of them in the same time. So no, I'm with you. And Toriano Pride, I mean, he we just don't know what he's going to look like. He had some spot starts in Clemson, you know, a couple, you know, a couple hundred snaps, but. That's at Clemson. What's it like at the SEC? What's it like in the new system? So I'm with you. Corner is a, is a concern. And I also agree. I didn't limit it to offense, defense, but kicker, <clears throat> considering how Mizzou has won their games the past couple of years, kicker <laughs> is going to be important. Um, so let's let's get away from the team a little bit. Let's move our way up to Eli Drinkwitz. Uh, obviously, he is one of the few coaches that is willing to give you time at SEC Media Days. And we're very glad that you get that opportunity and we get to get to hear our boy talk to you. I've been thinking, though, you know, over the past couple of years, you know, just what Eli Drinkwitz has done at Missouri of all places. I mean, th- this is a school and a fan base that resigned itself many years ago. It's like, well, maybe we'll get a blue chipper here or there. But for the most part, we're going to have to work hard, find the diamonds in the rough, polish them up and send them out there. And then here we go. Eli Drinkwitz is bringing in four stars from Pennsylvania, you know, and, and, and opening up a brand new recruiting pipeline of blue chip talent from Florida. Uh, just... You know, you, you've been in the SEC longer than we have, and you know recruiting. You know how this works. I feel like I'm not crazy in saying Eli Drinkwitz, given the school and the resources, is a top five recruiter as a head coach. What do you think about that statement? Mm, yeah, I, I've never – honestly, I've never sat back and thought about it quite like that. But, yeah, it's tough to argue against that. I'm trying to think in my head. Certainly Kirby Smart I think would be number one. He's – he may be the best recruiter of all time, and that's Nick Saban included. Uh, I think Sarkeesian does a really good job. I'd, I I would have to throw him into that mix. But um, hmm. and who else would stand out in your top five? I'm just trying to think. I mean, maybe Ryan Day at Ohio State, but that kind of recruits itself. Right, right. Dan Lanning at Oregon, he seems to be pretty voracious on the recruiting trail. Right, thanks to Phil Knight. Thank you. <laughs> 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 but, yeah, no, yeah, it's a great point. And, um you know, I, I'm not a big, uh, I don't follow politics that much or anything like that. Thankfully, I have my sanity. I, I just follow football. But I do uh, really appreciate the fact that they have changed state laws in the state of Missouri. I, I think that cannot be overstated as well with the, with the advantages they try to give that university. And it's all legal, so I got no problem with it. But I'll tell you who does have a problem with it, which, uh, w- which means it may come to an end fairly soon. But you know, you got that window, take advantage of it as, as, as long as it's open, but Greg Sankey hates it quite honestly. And he's mm. made, he's made that well known. He's talked about it publicly. He does not like, you know, how NIL laws are, are different from state to state. And, and some people have advantages and I would certainly put Missouri in, in a top tier category of advantages for NIL. But again, this is perfectly legal. There's nothing, they're not doing anything wrong. So, uh, Quite frankly, a school like Missouri has to do that because Alabama and Georgia and Texas and Texas A&M, LSU, on and on and on, they've been cheating illegally for so long. The fact that Missouri is doing something above board now 
is is causing an uproar i don't understand but I, again back to your point eli drinkowitz he he has done a, a masterful job recruiting and putting a fence around the state and, and not only that but when they lose a guy like a Caden Green, like a Mookie, Mookie Cooper we talked about already, you know, not burning that bridge, leaving that door open, so to speak, for them to come back, I think that's huge as well. Uh, and, and I think, you know, if they can continue this momentum and continue to, to win at a high level, I think we're going to look back at Luther Burden as that that key cog that, I mean, it all, it all starts with one. Nick Saban always credits um, – Julio Jones for being that first guy at Alabama. You you got to get the first one, and when you can bring them in, and, and it's it's funny. I don't I don't know if you caught this, but uh, at Media Day's drink was, he was asked about uh, like struggles, and, and I he referenced the Auburn game from a couple years ago where they, mm -hmm. if I recall, I mean, was it Pete who literally like dropped the ball, wouldn't even yeah. touch, was going to score a touchdown and win. But after that game, he's talking about how Luther Burden's removing all his Missouri from his all his social medias and, and stuff of that nature. But I don't know where I'm going with this rambling statement. But but basically, I mean, you you got to be bought in, and, and you got they needed that first guy. They needed to to bring in a five star, a local kid, and show that they could develop him. He could have went to Georgia. He could have went to. Ohio State. He could have went to he could have went anywhere, and he would have been successful. But to show these kids that you could stay home, you can be just as successful. You can got I don't know if you can see it, but I got the chips here. You, you get your NIL. You're going to be drafted. You know, uh, God willing, he doesn't get hurt. He's going to be a top ten pick, probably m much higher than that. Mm -hmm. um, you can win big at Missouri. Everything you want to do every elsewhere, you can do it here. Mm -hmm. And other guys have followed that lead. So, again, if Missouri continues to win, win big, I think Luther Burden is going to be a guy that, uh, heck, I, I don't know if you built a statue for him. Let's, let's see how good they do this year. But if, if they do, like, an amazing accomplishment this year, maybe you do get a statue because I think we're going to look back at him as, as being that key piece that kind of really sparked the turnaround at Missouri. Yeah, absolutely. And every coach has got one. Like you said, even Saban's got one. You know, for, for Pinkel, for Mizzou, for Mizzou fans from the mid-aughts, it was Chase Daniel and Jeremy Macklin. Getting those guys on board, it it, it all just took off right after that. Uh, and that was, you know, some recruiting wins, but also just on-the-field wins. This one was, yeah, this was a brand thing. It was a local five-star kid, like you said, choosing the school that was not viewed as a cool place to go from St. Louis kids, and he chose to do it. Then he got to be the chip man. Right now, now we do all sorts of food endorsements. I don't know if you got, we got to get you a frozen pizza, man. Uh, we got, we got those coming out. We're doing all sorts of branding with our players that, you know, Drinkwitz and whoever his team is just creative ways to get these guys out there. Um, and yeah, you know, you're doing it at Missouri, at Missouri. And I just, as a local guy, I never thought it was going to be possible. And he has just keep breaking through those, those glass ceilings that we have placed on our program. So i it's something to think about, and I don't know how I would power rank him. Again, that was just kind of off the cuff for you and me, but uh, it's something to think about as we go forward, especially if he keeps having this sort of success. So we've talked about the players. We've talked about the units. We've talked about Eli Drinkwitz. You mentioned the schedule. It is a favorable schedule. Uh, no SEC schedule is easy, but some are easier than others. And it kind of seems like even if, you know, for me, I would say it's probably the easiest schedule in the SEC this year, and I'm very glad. I love easy easy schedules. That makes me happy. But I guess when you're thinking of this team in particular that returns so much, has a, the schedule going forward that has a lot of wins out there, The it seems to be that not only myself included, but the fan base and just expectations in general, is Mizzou, whether they win the league or not, gets into that first expanded 12-team playoff. Okay. Now, you are not on the playoff committee yet. We'll work on it. You're not there yet, but we will work on it. So this is kind of trying to read minds, and I understand the kind of futility of that before we've even gone through it one time. But do you think Mizzou's schedule will keep them out of the playoff if they have two losses on the year? What are your thoughts? Well, I think it just depends on which two and – if it is losses, how bad were they? You know, and I would assume one would be at Alabama, like if they lose by twenty or more points, which again I don't I don't think will happen, but let's just say it does. And then let's say the other one is Oklahoma. Um, I don't think 
I don't think Missouri's getting in. I really don't. Unless, uh, unless let's say A and M's like eleven and one, and their their lone loss is is to Missouri. You know, and, mm-hmm. and I I certainly don't think A and M's going to be of that caliber. I mean, who else? Maybe a South Carolina's really good. Again, I don't yeah. see that. Yeah. If uh, if Vanderbilt's shockingly good, you know what I mean. Like there's there's just not a lot of quality wins there. Mm-hmm. Now you flip that around. If ten and two includes a win at Alabama, and Alabama's just you know is, is I don't think they'll they'll be as good as they were obviously under Nick Saban. But let's say they're like a ten and two type program, then maybe it's a different story. You know what if uh, again I we we can't. I hate to even just like jinx people, you know what I mean? But if there's like devastating injuries and right. and that's that's where you lose a guy or two, but you've won, you know, your last five games or something like that. Could you get in at 10 or two? I, I think that's going to be part of it, Nate, is just how's the team playing down the stretch? Because I think there's a lot of talk. I know your audience will, will just absolutely love this. But uh, Oklahoma, if Oklahoma goes nine and three, sure, can they get into the playoff? I've. I'm kind of leaning yes. Really? It, wow. But it, but it depends on how that nine and three goes. Sure. Like their their last couple, I'm trying to think, I'm just doing this off memory. I think it's Ole Miss, mm-hmm. Missouri, Alabama, and LSU. If they if they lose two of those games, I no, I don't think they're getting into the playoff. Because I, I don't think you're taking a team that's that's going win loss, win loss. I don't know. It it now instead if they let's say they start three and three. And then they win six in a row. Yeah, I think they're. If that makes sense, I, I think you're gonna you're gonna be taking the hot team, yeah. so to speak, in, in this model. So what does that look like for Missouri? Again, if they lose the A and M, if they add A and M, if they lose at Alabama, but let's say the the next couple games they win by twenty or more points, maybe they do get in because because they're all of a sudden they're a hot team, and maybe it was a a fluke call in Kyle Field that that cost them that one. Let's say Alabama wins the SEC. Maybe they're undefeated, and you lose to that team. There's no shame in it. So, I mean, we could kind of spin narratives all day, but yeah, certainly nine and three. I think Missouri will not stand a prayer, just given their schedule. I think ten and two, they're risking getting miss missing out, just depending on how those two losses play out. Sure, and I mean the other part is you know how many bids does each league get. You know, a lot of people are saying, you know, Big Ten and the SEC, yeah, just put in four or five teams. You know, they, they're the best league anyway. They got half the good teams in there already, so why not? Um, I mean, do you think the SEC is a is a, is a legitimate four-team league this year? And if you do, what, what four teams would you send in? Yeah, I mean, of course, Nate, that SEC podcast, I mean, put in six, put in seven. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, I, yeah, you know, quite honestly, the SEC, I thought, was very disappointing last year. Yeah. D- didn't have a national championship. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, Georgia didn't get in. And I I still, I'll go to my death saying if Georgia got in, which they didn't deserve to get in, but had they gotten in, they they would have won it, I think. Yeah. Uh, but that being said, um, non-conference that was, was very, very poor for the SEC last year. So will that continue? I certainly hope not. It's bad for business. But uh if it does, then then maybe the SEC only gets three. You know, I, that that seems like a stretch. But I think that sweet spot is four, four and a half. So, yeah, for, for the four getting in, if I had to pick them today, I'm going Georgia, I'm going Missouri, I'm going Ole Miss. And then that final spot, it's, it's a battle between, I think, Alabama, Tennessee, Texas, Texas A&M, that, those, I mean, there's, there's going to be so many teams playing playing into it, but I, I really think Texas is going to be one of the biggest disappointments in the SEC, so I don't have them in the mix. But I, th- I think I think Tennessee and Alabama will be fighting. Whoever wins that game, I think the winner of that will get a, the final SEC playoff spot. All right. Well, <laughs> you mentioned Texas, and it kind of seems like Georgia, Texas, and Alabama are kind of your consensus three best teams in the league. Uh, you know, I mean, I was going to say which one stumbles and why do you think that would happen, but sounds like it's going to be Texas. So why do you think Texas is going to stumble and how does that happen? <laughs> I mean, because they're Texas, Nate. Oh. I mean, that's what they do, uh, you know, when they get all this hype and all this. But no, it, it remains to be seen. I, I don't understand why people are 
all in love with Steve Sarkeesian. I, I think he's an elite play caller, certainly. But is he an elite head coach? Um, I'm not sure where anybody's getting that. I mean, he, he's been a head coach for 10 seasons. He's got one one season with 10 or more wins. One. And, yeah, wow. it came last year. But, again, <laughs> uh, what what happened? They beat Alabama, so everybody just fell in love. And then they turned around and they, they lost to Oklahoma. They were significantly better than Oklahoma. They lost to Washington, which I know had a bunch of draft picks and an elite coach, but they had no business losing that game. So they really had three games where they faced teams with equal or close to equal talent. They went one and two in those games. Mm -hmm. That's that's virtually every game in the SEC. So that ain't going to cut it. Um, I, I, and another thing, like I don't, it's like people are brainwashed or something, or they just don't do their research. I don't, I don't get it. But Texas was significantly better on defense than they were offense last year. So, again, why why they get the benefit of the doubt, I don't know. But uh, they're 15th in the SEC in returning, receiving production. They're having to replace everybody virtually at receiver, tight end, starting running back, all gone. Now, they raided the transfer portal, so I, I realize the cupboard's not bare. But same thing I said going back to Missouri and their defensive additions via the transfer portal – People just look at it like it's a video game, for, and I don't get mm -hmm. it. You, you, you don't just insert these guys. Remember last year, Nate, Georgia? Well, of course, your audience will remember quite well. Dominic Lovett yep. at Missouri, yep. and then Ra Ra Thomas, Mississippi State. That was the guy that just got arrested. But again, he was the best receiver at, at Mississippi State, so people were just saying, my God, Georgia, they're just, I mean, just imagine this offense with these guys. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Georgia was still good, but those, those guys were non-factors. Yeah. It it's just it's very difficult to to plug in these guys via the transfer portal. And and I'm sure your audience is sitting here, well, what about this guy? What about that guy? Go look it up. It's it's almost always the second year mm -hmm. that a guy makes that huge impact. So again, again, I don't think Texas is gonna be like awful or anything, but I just don't think they're gonna be near as elite as, as some people are already penciling them in. I'm right with Nick Saban. He says, hey, coming into this league and dominating, I, I, I firmly believe that. So it, it would not stun me if Texas goes like 8-4, and 9-3. and three. I, I think that, I mean, I, th I think they'll be a factor all year. Again, I'm not saying they're awful, but to pencil them in as one of the best in the conference, one of the best in the country, I'm not buying it. Yeah. Well, we talked about Texas. I have to talk about Oklahoma. You mentioned them earlier. Obviously, Mizzou and Oklahoma have been fighting online for like the past two years. We're stealing their recruits and all that sort of good <laughs> stuff. Um, obviously, the, the the game itself, the rivalry, the 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 Mizzou Oklahoma peace pipe, it's one sided, right? This is a, this is an Oklahoma team that won like you know a million games in a row, you know, eighty years ago, and so like that's okay. That's part of it. We understand that. What I don't understand is that, you know, when, when Oklahoma and Texas are coming in, they people talk about, kind of to your point, that they're going to fit right in. They're going to do just fine. Um, and and I would kind of believe that with Texas. They lose a ton of defensive, those defensive tackles. You can't replicate that again. Um, but, I, I you know, until I spoke with you, you know, I was like, uh, maybe Texas will be just fine. Oklahoma, though, I don't get it. And the reason is because this is a line of scrimmage league, Okay. They are importing what five offensive linemen. Okay, I, I understand they got stars. Like Oklahoma always has stars. The receivers are great. Jackson Arnold's elite, or Danny Stutzman is a, is a menace. I understand that. That's not the point. The point is, is you need guys on the line to win matchups. And I don't see five transfer offensive linemen coming into the to the Oklahoma first year in the SEC and letting them do anything that they did last year. What What are your thoughts on Oklahoma? Yeah, if they had an offensive, if they had Texas offensive line, I may pick them to win the league. <laughs> like, <laughs> like they're that good, but yeah, they don't. Like you said, I mean, that it may be the biggest liability outside of Mississippi State uh, on the line of scrimmage uh, there in Norman. So that that is just going to be so difficult. New offensive coordinator, new quarterback, like you mentioned, Jackson Arnold. Yeah, that, that's tough to to get around. But everyone I sp speak with there at, in Oklahoma, they just they love their offensive line coach, and they think he's just going to, you know, wave his magic wand, and they're going to be elite. So, hey, more power to them. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, that is the one of the biggest question marks in all the conference, I, th I think, truly, because Oklahoma demands excellence. 
I went to Norman for July 1st when they officially joined the SEC. Man, I, I mm -hmm. fell in love with the place. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever been up there, but they just got so many statues of Heisman winners and national championship coaches and the Selman brothers, and the fans are great. At least they were great to me I because I'm not a I, – I didn't tell them I like Missouri. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, no, they were great to me. But, yeah, I mean, th that is a huge, huge, huge issue – and particularly their first conference game is Tennessee. Ooh. I'm a Tennessee alum, and, yeah. and I, I think Tennessee may have the best defensive line in the SEC this year. So mm -hmm. that is going to be a major advantage for the Volunteers going to Norman. And that I think that will be the test case. Well, that will either expose Oklahoma or we'll find out because they got three non-conference games to start out. They're going to be heavily favored in those three. They got the first four at home, the, the fourth one being Tennessee. Not the... We're going to find out yep. if they're ready. We're, we'll yep. find out that day. And, and if they're not, then they got Auburn on the road, <laughs> tough place. Then they got Texas the game after that. So, I mean, Oklahoma's staring at down the barrel of 0-3 to start their SEC career. I, th I think that is – I don't think they'll be quite that bad, but – you could easily play out a scenario where that happens. Mm -hmm. But I do think Oklahoma is going to be one of the better teams in this conference on the defensive side of the football. I really like what I'm seeing from, from Brent Venables and his side of the football. Um, Jackson Arnold, you know, it remains to be seen. I don't, I don't know how closely you watched the bowl game that he started last year. He, he had some, some big mistakes, mm -hmm. put him in a hole, but then flashed his, his massive talent. So, he could be one of the better quarterbacks in the SEC. I, lo I love his receivers, too. His running back ended last season five straight 100-yard games. But but it, you're right. I mean, all that's nice. But if they can't block anybody, that means nothing. Yeah. So I think it's completely fair to question them. And I, I, I don't know. It, it remains to be seen. I, I'm kind of baffled they gave Venables a, a contract extension. <laughs> Like, why not wait to see how he does in the SEC? Uh, I think that would have been a lot smarter than than just, again, they didn't give him a bunch of money. They really was just two added years and a couple hundred thousand dollars extra bonus. But I think that was kind of foolish, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, we are we are coming up on a couple of co coaches who signed extensions in 22 where you're like, wow, that was that was very silly of you all. So it, it, it happens, and even the Blue Bloods make mistakes. But um yeah, I have no love for Norman. Uh, now, granted, I've only been there wearing black and gold, so I think the town smells like cow crap all the time, and it, it's just a, it's a podunk little town that sucks. Uh, but you know, I think they cl they cleaned out all the cow poop. Oh, for, good. Uh, SEC Network and all them. Very glad they were very considerate of doing that. That's fantastic. All right, let's put your feet to the fire. SEC championship game is who and who, and which team comes out the victor? I like Georgia, obviously. To it, this could be so weird without divisions. I, I like it and I don't like it in, in one sense because it's fun to talk about the East race and the West race, but it was kind of annoying how early November every year it was like Georgia had the East locked up yeah. and, and either Bama or LSU had the West locked up seemingly almost every year. But going one through 16 is, it's it's a challenge, Nate, and, and I'm not just sucking up to your audience here, but I, I do have Missouri as that number two spot. So I think it's Georgia and Missouri in the SEC championship game. But um, I do think it'll be Georgia that comes out on top in Atlanta. But I would say that just, you know, recent seasons, no, nothing your audience doesn't know, but the one team out of the East that gave Georgia more trouble than anybody was Missouri. Mm -hmm. And heck, so, some, some bad calls go the other way last season. Missouri may have even won that game. So yeah. um, I, I'm not – of the opinion necessarily that Georgia is like a mile above everybody in the conference and they're just going to cakewalk the league or anything like that. It's, they have a very challenging schedule themselves. It's not out of the realm of possibility. They lose a game or two even. I don't, I don't foresee that, but it, again, it, it wouldn't stun me. Uh, but I, I give me Georgia, give me Missouri in the SEC championship and, and give me Georgia to win it. Okay. You heard it here first from SEC Mike. That's Michael Braddon from that SEC podcast. 
coming in to drop knowledge about the SEC and give us takes about how much he loves Missouri this year. We're very excited. Listen to his show. Cousin Shane has been in our corner forever. SEC Mike and Cousin Shane give you great SEC coverage for the entire year, even the offseason, and all sorts of fun, fancy graphs that you can look at, not read, and just scream about on the internet. SEC Mike, thank you, sir, for dropping by. I always appreciate it. Yeah, anytime, Nate. Always a pleasure hanging out with you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Rock M Radio, a proud partner of Fans First Sports Network. Rock M Radio is the official podcast network of Rock M Plus, a new and exciting subscription service provided by me and the other voices of Rock M Radio. Please take a few moments to head over to rockm.plus and sign up for an account today. The cost is only $5 a month, and benefits include access to our live podcast, a subscriber only message board, weekly newsletters, and more. If you enjoyed this episode of Rock M Radio and would like to see more just like it beamed directly into your personal device, make sure to click the subscribe button below and tell your friends. Our podcast feed is available through the Apple Podcast app for iPhone, Google Podcast app for Android, whatever app you listen to your podcast. You can also find Rock M Radio on Spotify. If you're looking for a podcast about your favorite team that is not Missouri Tigers, Fan First Sports Network is your answer. A full podcast network loaded with the team-specific podcasts covering Major League Baseball, the NFL, NHL, NBA, MLS, and more. And we'll be back with more episodes of Rock M Radio coming to you soon. Thank you.